Okay, um, let me go ahead and start the session here today. Might be a little, relatively short here. Um, hopefully, uh, I haven't had, any, haven't, haven't had anybody join yet, so hopefully the audio is okay. Um, let me check that test, test. Uh, it's looking good here, so hopefully this recording is working. Um, all right, so let me go ahead and um, say a few things. Um, Today, um, I want to say one or two things about problem set three. So the problem set three has been evaluated and returned. So you should be able to, to look at the specific feedback um, that I gave in the grading rubric. If you look at your um, assignment that you posted. Um, um, I don't have, I think almost everybody, except for maybe one person had the first one plus the, yeah, the first two kind of questions here. Everybody seemed fine on that. Uh, one thing I did want to mention kind of real quickly, though, about the banker's algorithm. Um, uh, I see this a lot. So, so a lot of people seem to think that the way the banker's algorithm work is that you, you sequentially try each of the processes, starting with like process zero, um, and uh, see if it can run or not. And then if it can, you run to completion. So do process zero, one, two, three, four, and then you're done, OK? Um, and uh, oh, a couple of people were saying something like, you know, here, process zero is actually not a candidate, but they were saying process zero is not safe. I mean, technically, that's not right. It's it's not that process zero is safe or not safe. It's the, the, the whole state of the system. We have to determine if the, the initial state of the system is safe or not. So so what you really mean is process zero is not a candidate. OK, but. Really, the banker's algorithm, you don't try the process sequentially. What you're doing is, given the available resources, 5333, you, you have to first ask which processes needs can be met by the, by the currently available resources. So which processes are candidates, is, is the way I think of it, to be run to completion. So if you look at that, given 5333, uh, process 1, 3, and 4 are actually candidates. So really, if, when you do these problems on like the test for this unit, uh, it would be good to list the processes uh, that are candidates at each step, along with the, the available before. Uh, and then, so when you have candidates like this, so, so you know, here, you know, just to be clear, I, I think most everybody was getting this. So if we have 533 available, the reason why process zero is not a candidate is because it needs seven of A, and there's only five, right? And uh, process um, two is not a candidate because um, um, we're okay with A, but B, we need um, four of B and there's only uh, three of B, right? So that's why, but the other one, three and four should be candidates if I had this correct here, right? Uh, but yeah, the way the bankers are converted, if you have multiple candidates, you can in theory pick any of these, okay? So for our programming assignment three, um, uh, the, the tests require that you always pick the candidate with the lowest index, with the lowest process ID, right? So, so in our, um, when we program this for programming assignment three, we would select process one if these were the candidates, but we could have select process four to run first, and we, then we would have released process four's allocations, which was the 1100, zero zero, and ended up with available of 6433. Three. But anyway, so in, in the sequence that I show, um, um, we select process one to run. Uh, so we mark off process one as being completed. And when we return process one's allocation, so process one had an allocation of 0111, uh, we add that to 5333 to get the 5444, right? So that, that was how that worked. And, and I think most people were kind of getting that. But again, though, you know, it's not that I'm running, checking P0, one, two, three, four, and just checking them once, right? So now, you know, it could very well be that after um, I release those resources, P0 and P2, are now candidates. And in fact, P0 still isn't a candidate because it needs seven of A and we, and we didn't get any more of A. P2 was a candidate. Um, and in my solution, which I'm doing it like we would do it for the program assignment, you know, since P2 has the smallest index, I show release in P2. And then P3 is still a candidate. Uh, P4 would still be a candidate. But after P3 releases, now uh, only P0 and P4 remain to be run, and they're both candidates. Um, at that point, you really do know that the state is going to be safe, but you should show the complete sequence. Uh, and even better, I should probably add this to my um, my discussion here. And so after you show the sequence, it's good to actually have an explicit statement that we found a, a sequence uh, P1, P2, P3, P0, P4, therefore the state is safe. Right? So I probably should have stated that explicitly here. 
Um, and um, there's a little bit more problem on four, although again, maybe more than half, maybe two thirds or three fourths of people were pretty much getting this. Although again, um, maybe this is again, my kind of a do what I say, not what I do. I probably should have um, um, stated explicitly, you know, therefore um, this, there's a safe sequence the same as before. I, I kind of say that. So the same sequence shown in part three also proves that this state is safe here, right? So um, some people, you know, added this re new requested allocation um, to the wrong process, which I suspect they were using a different, an older version, you know, a different version of this assignment, uh, maybe, where, some, you know, sometimes I, I, I say a different process is requesting different amounts of, of additional resources, things like that. Some people um, were adding it to the wrong place. So we're like adding these allocations like to the need instead of subtracting them from the need. So, so basically what happens kind of in a nutshell, since, since these are in addition, that would, in, that would cause the allocations for P1 to go up. So this actually, we, add, we actually added those 2122 requests to, A's or to process one's original allocation. So we end up with a new allocation of 2233. Um, and I chose 2122 because that was, um, it's it's still needed, what was still needed for process one. So this was like giving process one's, um, all of its maximum um, claims that it needs, right? So, so you end up, if you subtract those um, from the need that we had before, um, process one has a need of zero. So that means that we've allocated all the things that process one needs for, um, uh, that it claimed to need at most so that it can run to completion, right? So now that process one has everything it ever needed, it, sh it, it should be able to run, um, you know, if we if we just only run process one until it completes, should be able to run and release its allocations back, right? And, and, and you actually get then the same sequence that we had shown here. So after we release process one's allocations, um, we would end up adding 2233 to the available and get the um, uh, 5444, uh, four, four, right? And then you have the same sequence as before, okay? Uh, but or again, you know, another way to say that is that, you know, since process one doesn't need anything more, um, it's certainly a candidate, right? Because all of its needs are less than or equal to currently available. So, so uh, and in fact, none of the other processes um, um, needs can be met because uh, there's only three of A, so process zero, two, and four are certainly not candidates. Um, and there's only um, two of B and process three says it needs three. So the only candidate initially is process one. But after we release the resources for process one, um, then we should find that um, two, three, and four are candidates and so on. All right. So that's all I wanted to say about that, but, but but be clear about what's happening, right? So we're not sequentially running these one by one. And, and that would also... Uh, help you actually implement the is safe method uh, for our assignment here that I'll talk about here in a second because you know you can't have a for loop that goes for for process zero to uh, a four or you know you, you could maybe make that work but but that's not really the correct way to do that you really want to have something like a while loop that just keeps happening as long as fine candidate process is returning back um, an actual process instead of the the no candidate was found, all right? So that, that's the better, the best way to implement um, the fourth task uh, for our assignment here. Um, so let me go ahead and, and move on to the fourth program assignment. Like I said, um, or I think I've said, um, I have a few people have been giving questions. So I know a few people are working on it, um, looking at the, um, uh, Looking on GitHub, I see uh, 14 people, maybe 15 out of the current 17 or 18 in the class have accepted at least so far. Um, I see a few people are done or almost done maybe um, on the assignment three. But yeah, if you haven't accepted, you're kind of a bit late. You need to get that accepted. Um, well, I guess it is Wednesday, so you still have today and Thursday, but you should definitely accept that and get going on it. Um, So I'm going to get my assignment three here again, so I can have the. Uh, on Monday, I did kind of go through these relatively quickly. I don't know. I mean, I don't have anybody here um, in person uh, to ask a question here. So 
hopefully these are relatively clear. Um, I think most people will probably find assignment three easier than the first two were so far, although assignment four might be back to about um, the same amount of, of work. Um, there were only four tasks here that you need to do, um, and, and you need to implement these first three number methods um, because they're going to be used um, in, explicitly or implicitly uh, to implement the, the fourth member method. And the fourth member method is basically uh, given the state of the system, um, uh, determine if that state is safe or not using the banker's algorithm, um, using the uh, the algorithm from, um, I guess I didn't reference it here, but using the algorithm from our textbook, um, uh, the, the, the 6.9, the algorithm in 6.9 C. So the, the safe function. Um, so yeah, I thought I might more talk about uh, this in a little bit more detail, implementing the is safe uh, member method. Um, so there's kind of two things you have to do uh, before you actually do the real work of the method. You have to uh, create two data structures. Um, so one is you have to make a copy of the resource available vector, all right? Because you want the copy because the resource available is the amount of resources uh, at, at the start when we're trying to determine if the state is safe or not. But as the, the process of simulating whether the state is safe or not, we're going to find a candidate process and then release its allocated resources. So we need to be able to add those back into to keep track of what is currently available versus what was originally available when we started trying to, to determine if the state was safe or not, All right, if that makes sense. So um, you can use the copy vector or you could just write a loop to, to do this, right? Um, so um, I showed this a little bit before some of the um, uh, details about how this assignment, the, the, the state class is set up, but uh, in general, um, the member variables, you've got two simple member variables, which is the number total number of resources and the total number of processes in the state. Right, so you'll need to use those. Um, so, but you need to make a, a copy of the resource available here. So you need to create an array, um, declare an array um, called, um, you know, like like maybe current available, like I did in the tests. And you need to copy everything from the member variable resource available to the current available. Okay, and you can do the same thing that that we did um, declaring these arrays in the class. So you can just declare it statically. So you could create an array called current available that you say has a size of 20. The size that you should use, uh, you know, you shouldn't give, you shouldn't, shouldn't use magic numbers. I've been giving that as a comment uh, in the previous assignment. I mean, you should avoid having number, you know, 20, one, zero in your code that um, can be a mystery to people trying to read the code. You know, what does that value mean, right? Uh, but here we do have some global defined constants, max process and max resources. So we'll never have simulations with more than 20 resources or 20 processes in them. Or if we needed to, we can, we can, uh, you know, that's another reason why you don't want to use um, magic numbers. Um, if I needed to like increase this to do a simulation with 100 processes, I could, if as long as everybody's always using max processes, um, um, when they declare an array or something, um, I could just change the value here and recompile the code, um, and it would correctly be updated everywhere. Instead of instead of for me having to search through the project um, for the value twenty, um, and um, you know, then also having to determine okay, is this twenty because it means like a max process, or is this twenty some other twenty max resources or something else? So, all right. Anyway, I mean, you know, that that this is you know, kind of good programming practices it's one thing that's considered uh, a code smell and, and considered a good um, uh, uh, practice uh, a standard practice uh, for programming is you know avoid magic numbers use global defined constants um, um, so anyway yeah you can use you can just use a for loop to copy the you, you can declare your own array like current available and then copy the values from the resource available into your 
current available um, before you start doing the assay function. Um, there is a copy vector. Um, it's actually not a member method. It's a um, it's just a regular um, function. Um, but yeah, we can look at how that's implemented. But yeah, copy vector basically takes um, oh, there's uh, um, you pass it in the number of, of items that you're copying. Then you pass in one array, an, an array of integers, which as the source. So you'd have to pass in the resource available um, um, as the source, and then your your like current available as the destination as the second, or sorry, as the third parameter, right? So that would just copy that over, right? But yeah, I mean, basically you could also just write your own loop, uh, same kind of things happening here. So, but you know, make certain that you are cop, you know, your loop needs to go over all the resources because. The, uh, th these, this is the available resources, right? So you need to go from zero to the number of resources um, if you do write your own loop. So, um, so besides that, you also need a second array, but you, uh, you're required to use like an array of Booleans. Um, Um, I mean, it does have to be an array of booleans because the, the the function that you pass it into, like the find candidate process, is expecting an array of booleans as input, right? But anyway, so you need an array of booleans. This array needs to be um, hold um, be the size of, of the number of processes, right? But again, uh, you could, you can, and probably should, um, um, you know, make your array of booleans. So instead of an array of integers, you have an array of booleans. Uh, but it, it's it's going to be uh, max processes because uh, the, the this completed array keeps track of whether each process is completed or not, right? Um, and you know, we, we do this in a lot of our tests. So, like the the test for task two, for example, um, testing the fine candidate, um, you need to. This is where you need to pass in the array of booleans. So, so we do kind of a similar thing, although you know uh, we're statically um, initializing it to have, because we know there's four processes in the state. So we statically initi initialize it to be size four and we initialize all of the Boolean values to false, right? But you need to do that. You need to create an array of Booleans called completed but init and initialize all the values to be false because initially uh, none of the processes are completed yet, right? So this keeps track of which processes are completed or not. Um, for the fine candidate process, right? Because your fine candidate process is not supposed to consider any process that's already completed as a candidate that can be returned. So. All right, so assuming you've got the, the, the three functions working before and you create these two data structures, you're, you're basically passing both of those into fine candidate process, right? Um, so it takes the completed array of booleans and the current available as input, and it returns um, the next the, the first candidate that it finds among the processes who, whose needs can be met. Okay, so this by calling find candidate process, you're um, implicitly also using needs are met because it it re if you implemented your find candidate process the way it was required, it should be reusing the needs are met to do it, its most of its work. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, the, the best way to implement this is you should have like a while loop that um, um, while the, the, the result that's returned from find candidate process is not equal to no candidate, then you're doing these things, right? So what you're doing is that um, um, if we have a candidate process or, or the other way you can do this is, um, um, well, yeah. So the, the, this here is describing the, the, the termination condition for the loop. So if no candidate is done, you should, the, the loop should stop. But um, as long as there's a valid process uh, as a candidate, um, you're going to call the you're going to reuse the release allocated resources. This takes in the current available um, and the process number that you're um, running to completion in order to release its allocations in the current available. And you need to mark that process um, as completed in the completed array, right? 
and then you would call find candidate process again and keep doing that um, as long as it keeps returning um, something other than um, uh, the no candidate, right? Um, and again, you know, don't use magic numbers. Um, so there is a global constant defined no candidate. So that's what you should be using instead of like doing a test uh, if if the result from find candidate is negative one, right? For the same reasons that I discussed, you know, you know, don't, don't want to use magic numbers like negative one. You want to use global defined constants here. Uh, but you're not quite done. So, so at some point, the loop will terminate. So either all the processes will end up being run. Uh, and then so then everything will be marked as completed. So then when you call find candidate process at that point, it will return back no candidate because everything's completed. Um, right? Or um, you might have run this and um, it returns no candidate because even though some processes aren't done yet, uh, the needs can't be met um, for um, uh, two or more processes. right? But yeah, to, to make your final determination if it's safe or not, remember that that our textbook says that a state is safe if you can find a sequence of process executions where all processes uh, execute to completion, then the state is safe. So we can determine if such a sequence was found by looking, uh, examining the completed um, array or a completed vector uh, when we're done. So at the end, if all the processes were completed, that means that there was that a sequence was found. The, the processes executed in some, we, we don't know what the order was of, of the sequence, uh, but there was some sequence of executions and all processes successfully completed. So, so here you, you'll need another loop. Um, and if you find any process that's not completed, you wanna return false as the answer. But if you get past that loop um, and it turns out that they were all completed, um, then you wanna return true. Um, the, the state is safe, all right? Um, and yeah, on this time, I don't, I don't think that there was anything extra you need to do. If you get the, the four um, tasks completed, um, you'll probably then be having the, um, um, uh, the system tests actually also um, passing as well, right? So I don't remember if I showed this before. Um, I think I'll go ahead and, and talk a little bit about this again. So, you know, um, I mean, the, the whole purpose of these assignments uh, is to build a simulation of some aspect of an operating system, okay? So for this assignment, we're building uh, a simulation of, of running a banker's algorithm on the current system state to determine if the state is safe or not, right? So um, um, the, these projects, these assignments end up building an executable that you can use to simulate that, to, to, to run a simulation. So in this case, uh, it's relatively simple. The simulation takes in an input file. That's all it takes as input. Um, and that input file uh, shows the, the you know, uh, describes the initial state of the system that we're trying to determine if it's safe or not, all right? So again, I, I don't remember if I, if I talked about this before or not, but, um, um, these are just some good things to understand in general about how things are working here. So, you know, if you do, if I do a completely clean build, if you watch this carefully, what you'll see is that, you know, it first does, um, for all these assignments, um, it first, it does what's known as incremental compilation. So for a compiled language, that's normal. So it, it first um, compiles um um, the source files into intermediate files, which are called object files, is what the .os are. Um, and then, although, you know, it's a little bit, so we're, we're using G++ both to compile things into the object files, but we're also using G++ to do the linking stage here, because what you'll also see is that it links together the object files. Like here, it links together the, the tests uh, and the state object file, and then our, um, our unit test uh, catch uh, unit test framework object file and the simulator exception object file into the test executable. And this is what is used um, in our testing framework to run all the unit tests here. But for all these assignments, it also links together um, um, the assignment three sim, usually with, with the other object files. So it doesn't include the assignment three test, but it will uh, instead uh, compile and Linked together the assignment three sim 
with the state and the simulator exception. Oh, and yeah, it doesn't it doesn't also doesn't include the uh, the catch two test framework because we're not doing unit tests. This is actually linking together the object files that are needed for the final simulation that's meant to be run as a command line tool. Okay. So you can look at um, this assignment three sim.cpp file. So every every one of our assignments will have an assignment whatever dash sim, um, which basically contains, it's basically just a main function, right? So if you know how C and C++ works, main function is special in C, C and C++. This is going to be when you compile your code into an executable. And when you ask the, ex, the operating system to run your executable, the, the first line of code that will start running will be the first line of code in the main function. And there can only be one main function defined um, in a C or C++ program, right? And another thing to understand about this is that um, we're using the command line arguments that are passed in. So if you've never used the argc and argv, they're meant in order to be able to pass in what are known as command line arguments or command line flags, right? Um, so yeah, I think I did discuss this before, so, so I'm kind of going over this again, but, but let, let's show how that works here. So let me open up a terminal. So to, to actually run these by hand, you do have to do this, these are meant to be run from the command line. So, um, so if you do a directory list, and you'll see that, that the sim and the test executables were built when I when I built my system, right? And, and you can run the test by hand if you want to, um, or you can run the sim. Um, and I, I may or may not have discussed this before in the class, but the way that um, the way that the the, the the command line uh, in a like a Linux environment or a Unix environment works is it searches your path to find programs to run. And, and this was my current path environment variable. So it actually searches these directories. So if I say sim, um, it's going to try and search in this directory and then this directory and then this directory and this directory um, and, and these here, right? Everything separated by a colon here is a separate directory that it searches. But there's no sim in, in any of those because I don't have my current directory, uh, which is this directory is not on my path, right? So I could add that to my path, but most people don't do that. Um, um, instead, or you could always give um, the full path name. So if you give a full path name, it doesn't have to search the path. You're telling it explicitly, I want to run the sim that from the root of the file system uh, is in the workspaces subdirectory, uh, which is which then has an assignment three solution subdirectory, which then has the executable sim that I want to run, right? But as a shorthand, you can use dot, which means the current directory. So since I'm currently in workspaces assignment three, dot slash means relative to my current directory, uh, run a file called, an executable called sim here. Um, so you notice if you don't give any command line parameters, you're getting the usage message. So basically um, this code here is expecting argc to be two. If it's not equal to two, it prints the usage message. So that is where this is coming from. And this is common um, in like command line tools, um, although often there's like a flag, like if I want to get the usage message for for like the ls command, which is for listing the files uh, in my current directory, I can use dash h um, and that will, um, oh no, um, I guess you have to use dash dash help for ls, so it depends on, on the tool, but, but yeah, that, that's the usage message for help. Um, Um, and, and the reason why the argc is expected to be two here is that it counts the name of the program as one argument. Okay, so there, I only gave, so argc would actually be one here the way I typed it in and it's expecting that it needs to be at least, needs to be exactly two because the second argument um, is supposed to be the name of the simulation file we use as input that we're going to run the banker's algorithm on to determine if the state is safe or not, right? Um, and then argv, you can think of argv then, uh, th that has the actual argument value. So for this assignment, it's simple, uh, but you can think of these as just old style C character arrays, right? So argv zero is gonna actually hold uh, an array of characters, which is the name 
uh, of the program as it was typed in. But argv1, since, since it's, again, since we're using zero-based indexes, so, so index zero, if we have two, uh, if we have two command line arguments, index zero of argv is the name of the program. Um, and argv1 then is the second command line argument or is the command line argument at index one uh, of argv here. So that's actually gonna hold you know, this string here, sim file slash state dash your one dot sim, except it's a character array, right? Uh, but that's what the load state is expecting. It's, it, oh no, I'm sorry. The load state is expecting a new C, new style C++ string, but we can convert an old style array of characters, which is what argv1 is, into a string like this. So that converts it into a new C++ style string. And then we pass that in. That, that should be the, the name of the file that we want to open. Right? And again, you know, notice my path here um, is relative to my current directory, right? Because um, in my current directory, there's a, um, um, a subdirectory called sim files, which you can also see uh, in the Visual Studio Code um, file explorer here that has the input files, which are the .sim, and the result files, which are the um, expected output that we use for the system tests, right? So I can actually list all those files that are in the sim file subdirectory using the ls command. I should see all those, right? So, you know, again, I could have um, specified the full path name from the root in my current dev container to the, the, the file that I want to run as input, right? So that would work. Um, but um, if you don't have a slash at the at the front, the 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 thing that tries to open the file assumes that you mean a relative file name, right? And of course, you know this this file has to exist. So um, that's part of what the the load state does. You can go and look at the code for load state, um, you know, if you want to, and the um, uh, state.cpp file. So one of the first things that load state, and, and this is, again, this is similar, um, pretty much all of the simulations for this class, all the assignments for this class have one function to load in the input file in order to, to, to start to initialize all the things that's needed for the simulation. And then they have another main function like a run simulation in this, um, or actually in this assignment, it's just the is safe function. That's kind of the main one that does all the work of the simulation. So you're directly implementing that. So, uh, but yeah, our load state basically tries to open the file using new style um, input file stream, um, um, you know, to, to try to open up that file. Um, and it does a little bit of error checking. So if you give a invalid file name, um, it won't uh, die, it won't crash kind of unexpectedly. It will detect that um, and give you an error message um, about file not found. So. Um, although um, hmm, I need to check that code, so uh, I don't know why we're getting a core dump there. I thought it would catch that exception um, and exit cleanly. Anyway, that's not a big deal. But um, Okay, so then, you know, so that was an example of actually just running the program on, on the first state. And by the way, this is the same state, you know, I mentioned this before, this is the same state as like the figure 6.9 in our textbook. This uses an example of the banker's algorithm, the one that had uh, four processes and three resources here. So, and, and this state was safe here, right? This output is coming from, um, of what the the initial state of the system was and what so the state is safe uh, comes from um, actually from the uh, the sim here. So we call the is safe function that you implement. And if you return true, we output that final, the state is safe determination. And if you return false, we just output the state is unsafe, right? But the, the initial state of the system before we call is safe comes from here. We output the instance of our state object to a, a, the, the standard out stream, the C out stream. And that works because we have defined 
um, an overloaded output stream operator, which calls the two stream method, right? So again, you can look at those. So, so if you look at the overloaded operator for our in state.cpp, um, which is here, this, uh, this allows you to put um, a state on the right-hand side of an output and, and a stream on the left-hand side, um, and that will end up invoking this, right? And then all we do is, you know, the, the stream, which is C out, uh, we stream the result of calling two string method um, into the, 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 the stream, the C out stream, right? So that's how we ultimately end up in the two string. The, the, the two string here is the thing that's outputting the state of the system. So it's outputting the, um, the claim matrix, um, the allocation matrix, and the need matrix, uh, and then the, the initial, uh, the, the, the total amount of resource vectors and the initial available uh, vector that we have for the, the state. All right. Um, so, um, so as the final thing, so like I said, again, for this assignment, you didn't really have to do anything, I don't think, uh, but um, um, you can check uh, if your unit tests are all working, you can check um, if the system tests are running. Um, so again, you can do that from using a make command. So, so try to make, uh, to have it invoke the system tests, right? Um, you can run the system test by hand. So sometimes, I mean, all the system test is doing is running um, this uh, this is actually a shell script to run the system test, okay? Uh, but one final thing I kind of want to mention, all the system tests really do is um, they run your program, let's say on state 01.sim, like I just did there, but it, it captures the output. So, so all these simulations put all the output of running simulation on standard output. So we can redirect that output um, into a file on a Unix command line. So, um, something like that. So, so now instead of having the output go to standard output, the output went to my results out, right? Um, and I can, for example, use the cat command to out to, um, um, output to show what's in that file on the command line here. So I'll get the same thing. But all the system tests are doing is running a diff uh, between Say, um, just as a real silly, simple one, but if I even for misspelling. So it considers any difference um, as not passing the expected system test, right? So, so if I misspell something in the output I'm supposed to be producing, um, um, so we could recompile that um, and um, we can rerun our simulation and capture the results. Um, but, um, oops. Got to rebuild it. I, I clean, but I, I, I delete everything, but I forgot to rebuild. So we can recompile it. We can capture the, the results. So, um, so now notice, you know, I'm now saying state is stuff instead of safe, right? So now if we do the diff, um, it will report a, a difference on line 31. So the first one uh, is what the line 31 was in the first file of the diff, 
right? So the, the arrow to point to the left means. And then the second one is what the line was, line 31 on the um, second file, the, the expected result file, right? So yeah, if, if anything is different, um, it reports in the system tests um, as that, that system test failing. So now um, all of my uh, ones that were supposed to say in the state is safe are going to be failing because of that um, thing. But yeah, if, if you don't know why something's failing, you probably have to run it by hand and maybe even use the, the diff tool by hand to see exactly which line. So a lot of times, like for the next assignment, you do have to do some stuff <laughs> for assignment four to get the system test to pass. Um, so, you know, um, so, so you might have to do that to check that your output, you're not, um, you know, even things like differences in the amount of white space, spelling mistakes, things like that, you have to get right. Plus also you could have bugs so that, so that you know, at some point you're not quite doing the correct thing in the simulation and, and, and you start getting different results, Your results start to diverge. Um, um, all right, I think that that's all that I wanted to say. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the session here. Uh, you know, keep the questions coming. Um, you know, that's kind of what, oh, one thing, maybe I should put this announcement, but go ahead and kind of always email both me and uh, uh, Mr. Singh, um, our GA, if you have a question about the program assignments, that way, you know, uh, you'll get the fastest response. So whichever one of us happens to be available first um, can kind of respond. Um, and give some help for things. So, um, all right, but yeah, keep the questions coming. Uh, hopefully, everybody, most everybody, um, can get this assignment done um, this time. Get the full points. Uh, we'll see. Um, and that's it. And um, I will talk to you guys later. Then.